Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the next in our webinar series as part of the Timber Development UK Southside Hereford University Design Challenge 2022. Um, our topic tonight is timber buildings, off-site and industrialised construction. We have a fantastic panel of speakers to share their thoughts and ideas with you. Um, before I introduce them, I'll introduce myself and give everyone who may be new to this competition a little bit of background. Um, so I'm Kirsty Connell Skinner and I'm the Sustainable Construction Partnerships Manager at Edinburgh Napier University. Edinburgh Napier University is delighted to be one of four partners, uh, together with Timber Development UK, the Passive House Trust and NMIT, the New Model Institute for Technology and Engineering, um, as that are part of this academic competition. Um, so the purpose of Southside Hereford and why we're all here tonight is that um, Hereford is aspiring to be one of the greenest and fairest cities in the country. Um, and to help do that, they are um, looking for requirements for the south side Hereford, which is going to be a physical building to provide a vibrant, inspiring and inclusive sports, food and skills community. So three kind of different clients, all wanting a really, really beautiful south centre uh, and a focal point for the people in South Y. The challenge to our multidisciplinary teams, and I know our teams are starting to get going and that people are starting to find each other and it's all very exciting. Uh, challenge is open to multidisciplinary teams between four and eight people studying built environment in a course in the UK university or who have recently graduated. If this is a new, if you're here for the first time tonight, please register as an individual uh, participant. We'll help you form a team or you can come and find other teams. We've got a great WhatsApp with chat. You find each other and Tabitha here from Timber Development UK can, can also assist with that and we'll share a bit more uh, in terms of the chat and links and so on. So um, a little bit of housekeeping before we start, if we can ask you to keep your video off and, and yourself on mute. As the speakers are presenting, please add questions into the chat and we can take some time to, to answer them. And then at the end, once we've uh, sort of finished the, um, obviously we need the bandwidth for the presentations, but once those are done, uh, we can turn on our videos and we can see each other and, and have a chat as well. And there'll also be a bit of time afterwards to help with team building or if you've got any questions specifically for Tabitha about um, the actual competition logistics. So not to delay any further, but to introduce you to our fantastic panel this evening, again, talking about timber buildings, offsite and industrialised uh, construction. Uh, first person I'd like to introduce is my colleague, uh, Professor Robert Hairstons, who has a dual role at both Edinburgh Napier University and at NMIT. Uh, Robert's specialist knowledge is in the field of timber technologies and engineering. He, uh, where am I going? Uh, he is the um, director of uh, the, um, or indeed the founding director of the Centre for Advanced Timber Technologies at NMITE and uh, leads the Centre for Offset Construction and Innovative Structures at Napier. Um, I could embarrass him by listing all his many accolades, which include a major contribution to the 2015 Queen's Anniversary Prize for Innovation in Timber Construction and Wood Science at Edinburgh Napier, um, as well as 2018 Herald Higher Education Award for establishing the Built Environment Exchange to accelerate change in construction culture. Um, but what I will leave you with is that Robert is incredibly committed to enabling the uptake of timber and sustainable construction um, through a cooperative and um, inclusive way of working and accelerating particularly students' careers. Uh, Next on our panel, we have uh, Tim Crump from Oakwrights. Uh, Tim's early carpentry career um, was spent repairing old oak frame cottages in a farmhouse with a copy of w, uh, FWB Charles's con conservation of timber buildings in one hand and his saw in the other. I just love that image, Tim, that's fantastic. He started Oakwrights in 1999, designing and constructing new oak framed homes and buildings. He's got a real passion for industry leading technology. And he's constantly striving to design and build oak frame houses, outbuildings, extensions in the most efficient way. As far as we know, Oak Rights is the only UK oak framers to build certified passive house in the UK. And so a really fantastic level of skills and knowledge and foresight that, that Tim has that he's um, going to be able to share with you this evening. And last but not least, Really delighted to welcome Helena Lilo, who's a Chief Technical Officer at Volumetric Building Companies, or VBC. Helena has, I'm not going to say how many years, because that's very rude when uh, we're speaking women to women, uh, several years experience from academia, working with timber engineering and industrialised construction. Uh, she's got a fantastic level of publication and presentation as an academic, and her textbook, Industrialised House Building, is used at several Swedish universities. 
Um, that said, after what an astonishing and fantastic academic career, uh, Helena is propelled into industry. Uh, between 2010 and 2021, she worked at, I'm going to probably mispronounce it, so forgive me, at Limbax Big, uh, looking at R&D and design. Um, she's now a Chief Technical Officer at Volumetric Building Companies, based, the company is based in the US, um, where she looks at a whole range um, of uh, industrialised building um, uh, scope. So that's uh, design data, data flows, BIM modelling, lean construction methods, modularization, configuration. What she's really keen to do is always look to optimise the entire supply chain and, and look to facilitate that product and process flow. So really exciting and fantastic range of speakers we have here tonight. And um, so without further ado, I'm going to ask Robert to kick us off. I'll unmute myself. Thank you, Kirsty. Uh, I'll just bring up my presentation, uh, which you should now see. Yeah, and I will crack on. I hate that. That should be all OK, right? OK, yeah, so I just want to kick off the, the proceedings tonight really by giving a sort of um, overview of off-site and industrialised timber construction. Yeah, and, and hopefully frame much of what our, our speakers will go into with further depth through the, the lens of their uh, respective organisations. So just to jump straight into it, um, yeah, the UK timber industry, just to give you some high level information really with regards to, you know, what we do in the UK, given that's where this project is to be centred. You know, we are one of the largest global importers of, of timber. Uh, timber platform frame construction, which you can see the bottom left hand corner is the, the most commonly used form of timber construction in the UK, particularly in the sort of new build uh, housing market. Uh, and indeed, that's quite on a, an upward trajectory given the, the UK sort of housing targets in terms of delivering affordable housing uh, and also moving towards net zero carbon because it's an efficient and effective way of doing so in many respects. Um, we pioneered the use of cross-laminated timber as much as we did not invent it. Um, Austria and Germany uh, you know, come up with the more mass timber solutions in that respect, but we have pioneered its use. In the top right-hand corner, you can see for what was a short period of time the tallest timber building in, in, the, in, in the world, uh, formed from CLT in Murray Grove in London, but as we'll touch upon later, that's uh, yeah, that was only the, the start of that. That's moved on considerably in, in other uh, other countries. But we don't currently have a mass timber producer as such uh, of commercial scale. We, we are piloting and pioneering much of that and indeed doing a lot of that work currently in, via uh, in Scotland with the Innovation Centre and Ecosystems. And you'll see that in their transforming timber takeover later on in the series. Um, but mass timber and the use of homegrown timber is absolutely viable. And again, we'll, we'll cover that off there. But there are ongoing barriers to uptake in terms of utilisation of timber the timber technologies in, in the UK as a result of, sort of government policies, market perceptions, and indeed a, a lack of know-how. Because even although we do a lot in terms of timber frame construction, it's often uh, you know wrapped in a, a block, a block finish, block and render, or, or brick skin. Um, so you, often the public may not even quite realise that they're living in a timber frame timber frame house. And there's other issues such as fire performance and the impact of Grenfell, which have influenced the use of timber in construction, even though the Grenfell disaster had nothing to do with timber uh, and, and indeed was quite the opposite of using natural product products for, for construction and delivery. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, presentations thus far on why the use of, of timber and I think um, this isn't a, my research it's something that was published in the iStruct T and um, the results of which you could you could debate I think that just the high level piece is really timber is sustainable it sequestrates carbon utilizing the built environment locks that carbon in for longer but that's only the case if we use it efficiently and effectively relative to other materials and I think that's why offsite and industrialized forms of construction are important but sustainability is broader than that. Um, COP26 was here last year in, in the UK. Um, sustainable development, you know, there's 17 sustainable development goals, etc. And indeed, the built environment has a huge part to play. Um, but just if you think of this in a sort of rationalised manner, I like to look at this sort of five capitals model of natural capital, social capital, human capital, financial capital, and manufacturing capital. And that's really around the sort of 
value piece and thinking about what we do in terms of life value. Um, and therefore, if we start thinking about the different capitals, it's really about how we can respond in a, as, as a value proposition or optimised manner. So we have to think of that collectively in, in the round and not just think about productivity indeed, because if you're putting the wrong things in and you accelerate the productivity of it, then you only accelerate the environmental impact. So we have to think of it in the round. And in that regard, that's where timber is really good because ultimately it's a naturally renewable carbon sequestrating material, which can be used for construction delivery. We do spend 80 to 90% of our time in the, in the built environment, um, but buildings and construction have a huge global impact in terms of embodied energy, uh, embodied carbon, as well as operational energy and operational carbon. So we have to think about how we deliver it using uh, the right materials, but equally using things such as passive house, passive house approaches, how we uh, reduce our energy consumption. We have a, a skills crisis. We need uh, to upskill, reskill. We need 350,000 full-time employees to reach net zero carbon. So that's the whole human capital piece. We need to maximise the resource, the value, the ton of it, and minimise the impact of other associated activities. And we also have to think of uh, the construction and the energy efficiency of, of the buildings. And in, indeed, like I say, if we enhance the level of productivity, but minimising waste uh, through, that, through that process. In terms of construction itself, there's key drivers that play in terms of how we deliver construction. So again, the sustainability, we need to affect cultural change. There's that human capital piece in terms of skills. There's productivity itself, digitization, and, and the regulatory drivers that are at play. And as we'll go through in this presentation, it's, it's really how um, you think of those drivers and the, the convergence of them and what, the, if you think of those, the convergence of those drivers relative to the context, and relative to the right articulation of the offset and industrialized approach, then we can respond to to that to the uh, to to who we deliver construction more appropriately. So, like, where am I going with this? Right. So, where I'm going essentially is to try and build the case of why we need to use offsite or industrialized construction approaches. So, if we think about the five capitals model in terms of delivering the built environment and the convergence of those drivers, then that essentially says you need to use a more biogenic or naturally renewable approach, which is timber. And if we think about construction and the key drivers that sit within that and the convergence of those, that essentially means that you need to use off-site and industrialized construction approaches. So if you take those two things in combination, that essentially means that you need a biogenic off-site manufacturing approach to the delivery of the built environment. And that built environment in many respects, to be our living lab, uh, which we can fully understand through, through digitization. And we'll unpack more of that, hopefully through the, the transforming timber takeover. So hopefully that sets maybe the kind of uh, academic methodology uh, approach to, to, to justifying why. And then I just want to run through off-site industrialized timber construction and how it can be used to deliver quality and efficiency at, at scale. Um, and in terms of you know, recommended reading as such. This is the, the book that I authored uh, for BM Trada. Uh, and within that, there's a, there's a whole bundle of uh, resources and, and recommended uh, recommended reading. And it's just to say that offsite isn't new in the first instance. It's often thought of that this is a new thing. Uh, it dates back to crook frames, indeed, in medieval periods, um, where they made uh, crook frames in the carpenter's yards, marked them up, took them to site, and assembled them for efficiency. Um, we have the Manning Cottage, which was shipped to Australia, um, and it was, all it was all based upon efficiency and, and quality at the time, right? Um, so that it's, it's evolved. You know, we've got crook frames, um, we had mechanisation, uh, we have post and trust, post and beam, and modern post and beam systems, and these are all uh, still utilised today. In terms of, I mentioned timber platform frame, which is common, common in the UK, and it was invented in the, in the US. We had balloon framing, which is becoming more readily used now as well, because of has been touched on in other webinar series, because it can help in terms of reducing uh, thermal bridging. Uh, we have, as I say, platform frame, and then move towards more closed panel uh, platform systems using uh, the availability of, of engineered products and engineered joists, etc. So these systems have evolved. 
And indeed, cross laminated timber, which is the glued mass timber system, has evolved. But you know, mass timber systems have, have, have been around as well. You know, using round log constru construction through mechanization and, and the onset of, of sawing technology going to square logs so they fit together better, right? Uh, and then, as I say, you can now uh, create these mass timber slabs and CLT, et cetera, using uh, lamellas. Um, Industrialised and construction isn't all about massive factories. Um, indeed, you have mobile and flying factory concepts. You have mobile framing equipment. We have mobile sawing equipment, um, wood misers, uh, which are used to, uh, to turn logs into uh, dimensional timber. And there's interesting organisations such as ModCell doing pop-up factory uh, techniques in, in straw bales and, and building uh, large section framing, frames in, in a, a pop-up factory environment uh, at or near to site. We have other really interesting things like, you know, this sort of wiki house open platform technique using uh, CN, so digital design, and then integrating that with CNC machine so you can fabricate uh, plywood into different shapes and, and slot it uh, together. Um, uh, so there's like wiki house and facet homes and a uh, really interesting work by Lauren Sass over in uh, uh, MIT that's, that, that's looked at this as well in terms of response to uh, disaster relief. And then, you know, just to, uh, as much as there are these uh, different areas in terms of sort of four categorizations and there's always this thing of trying to categorize off-site uh, construction, but we have this sort of panelized uh, modular and volumetric solutions. We have hybrids where you bring panelized volumetric sub-assemblies, bring the constituent parts together in terms of uh, hybrid industrialized or off-site approaches. And then we have uh, sub-assemblies and components. So that's precision engineered sub-assemblies. So making the sub-assembly in the factory, taking it to site and assembling it uh, and putting it together to, to maximize efficiency and waste. There's a range of approaches because different sites have different things at play. And we have to think more broadly than just what you can make in the factory because you have to think about A, getting it out the factory door. So is your factory door big enough? You have to think about getting it in a wagon and getting it down the motorway and conforming with the, um, with the, with the, the highway requirements. And once you get it to site, you have to, to, to get what you've made into position. Um, so, you know, are you going to use a crane? What's the reach of the crane? What weight are you lifting? Do you have a lifting plan? So there's, and can you get that crane on site? So there's there's different things to think about. Um, modern methods of construction is often used uh, and considered as a as offsite. It's it's not MMC has a broader bandwidth, and that's been covered in one of the previous uh, one of the previous webinar series. So it's just to make the point that MMC is a process about better quality and, and efficiency. And in doing, by moving to the factory environment, that really comes into the fore. So you can think about the production process, you can think about sub-processes off of that, so you reduce bottlenecks. And the, the whole ethos and uh, approach to this is really about uh, utilising lean thinking and lean approaches and, and things such as Kaizen and, and so on. So it's, it's really about how you make the process more efficient, uh, just in time delivery, and, and, you, and, and have, have it transparent also as well. So when you when you move into production line and you get more standardized because of your uh, the market that you're delivering to, you can introduce higher levels of mechanization and automation. And now there's organizations that provide full full lines, including robotics, uh, for 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 mechanization. So you you can you can look into that. Uh, also, and what powers that is essentially digital integration and digital approaches. So that's your computer aided design and computer aided manufacture, and correspondingly utilizing the principles of design for manufacture and assembly. So you're designing it, thinking about the capability of the production line and, and, and how it can be utilized to respond to the to the given building requirements. And what you can see here is essentially the equivalent of a, a timber platform frame house. Um, the wall panels that are segregated out, the associated cutting list, uh, which also determines your grade of, grade of material, your level of OSB, uh, and indeed down to the number of nails that you use. So you can therefore get the drive the efficiency through that and integrate that also with things like enterprise resource planning. So you can call off materials uh, from, from a sort of vendor solution to feed that process. So you can get a, a larger degree of vertical, vertical integration.
So just as I say, there's off-site, there's modern methods of construction, there's a full range, right? We go from panelized systems, hybrid forms, large section framing, volumetric, mass timber, and mo mobile and digi digital manufacturing. Just a myth bus, because this is something that, that often gets confused. And the reason why I'm putting SIPs in here is SIPs are not the same as timber frame construction. SIPs are structural insulated panels. The reason why they're structural and insulated is because you bond the foam and the internal to the OSB to create a rigid product, uh, which provides you with, uh, with racking performance and can also carry line loads. So that's why it's a structural insulated panel as compared to uh, a panelized or a timber frame system. So please don't get those confused. And then in terms of mass timber solutions, we have a, a range of those grown from glue lamb, laminated veneer lumber, nail lamb, laminated strand lumber, parallel strand lumber, CLT dowel lamb, which use, uses um, timber dowels, often normally hardwood, they absorb with, uh, with moisture uptake and then lock software panels together. So there's a range of uh, mechanical effects uh, as well as adhesively bonded, as well as um, yeah, full timber solutions uh, with different lamellas and different uh, con uh, timber constituents. I've touched on cross laminated timber. You know, a lot of the work was pioneered in, in the UK in terms of uh, Murray Grove and uh, likes of Dalston Lane, et cetera. So much of which has been impacted because of uh, the sort of fire regs and uh, lack of understanding. Um, but just to give a sense of how it's made, you defect cut, you finger joint it, the lamellas, you lay it up to maximise the performance, um, you press it together, and then you, you CNC uh, route it to get, you know, cut out your doors or your, your, your openings, etc. And, you know, we're now at a, uh, the position with, in Norway, we have an 18 storey all timber building and uh, Mjostrene, uh, which is made up of primarily cross laminated timber. So that shows you this sort of market trajectory. But equally, in terms of, um, you know, we use, and, and Tim will touch upon it, uh, we still do the, the whole post and beam uh, piece. We use CAD CAM and often glue lamb beams are used and uh, in, in this type of, of, of scenario also. So we do the you know the bespoke high end residential all the way up to the to the, the tall timber buildings. And there's really neat things like what Lucas Lang do using standardized component parts and standardized connections where you can you can reconfigure how they're put together to come up with uh, different different solutions. And then Helena will talk later about you know timber volume elements. Uh, and using volume, volume uh, timber systems at scale. And of course, what they're looking for to do that is, is a, a good degree of standardization so you can improve, improve throughput. But again, of course, there are hybrid forms. I would encourage you to look up things like the, the B Sky B Believe in Better Builder. I really, that is an example because it used a large range of, of timber. Uh, products and systems for a for a commercial building, and then really interesting one, of course, like the McAllen Distillery, uh, where again you've got hybrid uh, steel and and timber, so using steel brace frames, but using uh, a, a, an undulating with a, a timber cassetted roof and, and uh, producing a, an undulating form. So it, it demonstrates the scope of what you can do. So you know, just to kind of close off, really, um, before we can. Kind of look through this with the lens of, of really forward thinking organizations. Um, what I would say is there's a vast array of timber products and systems out there that you can consider. And then it's about how you utilize them to respond to your given, given context and thinking about um, the, the range of, of products and systems that are available and how they can be used uh, in different ways uh, in terms of offsite construction. And you know these individuals will go, go through what their businesses are doing, but you've got likes of what Oak Rights are doing, which is is really interesting because it's a lovely blend blend of that sort of craft based approach with uh, the CAD CAM system, and then you've got what Helena will explain is how they're doing the, the volumetric work through this platform design and looking at the integration of of the of the supply chain, and it's all predicated in the fact that we want to to use timber. Uh, to deliver the built environment efficiently and effectively in order that we can, yeah, in, in many aspects, uh, tackle this, the, the climate crisis uh, and, and, and move forward with more biogenic responses to con construction and delivery. So with that, I'll, I'll thank you and, and hand over to the other speakers this evening.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Robert. What an amazing range of, you know, both offsite and industrialised methods that all our competition participants can think about, can find out more about and can see what wonderful ways they can combine. Um, on that note, I'm going to ask um, Tim, as uh, Robert was uh, just, just showing there some of the, the wonderful work of, of Ocrex. Um, Tim, are you able to, to share your, your presentation with us? Um, hopefully, we've. I've, I've just had a power cut. Oh and no! Everything we've, that we prepared, I lost. I've been gone for about five minutes now. We're back online, so you might need to give me some assistance to um, get going again. No worries. This is this is a good and friendly space. Everyone's going to be Wonderful. very supportive. <laughs> be patient. So, <laughs> how do how do we get my screen back up? That's a big question. Okay, so don't share screen. Uh, I can't see. Yep, got that. Share screen. Okay. Is that looking good? How are we looking there? Can everybody see what I'm Nothing. No, we've not got anything yet. Yeah. Okay, let's um, share screen. Sorry about this. We've been through this all once before, haven't we? I'm, I do apologise, and uh, I, I unfortunately we were all set up. So we are on screen one. If I share screen two, how would I go about doing that? So at the bottom of the Zoom screen, um, you should have a green button that says share screen. Yeah, I've got that. Yeah, share screen. Um, if you click on that, you should be able to choose. The right one. I'm pressing share screen. Mm. Uh, see the slides. Yeah. Yeah. We okay. Can. Fine. Well, I, I do apologise for that. I had a power cut. That's living out here in Herefordshire. Um, and I think, Robert, amazing presentation there. And I think a lot of the points that you had, I was going to talk about. So we probably should have, I probably should have looked at your talk beforehand. So what I will do is I'm going to glide through the slides here and uh, talk through what we at Oak Rights do and how I think that what we do may be able to help the students in their design process and a little bit about, uh, about the history of where we come from. So history of oak framing, history of panelized production and oak rights. Um, I started off many years ago, probably about 22 years ago now, and I'd been in the construction industry for many years before that. I'd always had a passion for machinery, um, any, anything to help produce timber frames and the, the, the buildings that we were working on. So that was how we started. And then gently, as time has gone on, we built up to firstly building oak frames and then moving towards the encapsulation of the oak frame. And I would say that now our business, probably we carry out more encapsulation or for production, more encapsulation, we do have actual oak framing. So the oak framing is growing, but the encapsulation is growing more. So we'll move on. So the history. Really, this, um, this talk is about how you can use panelised construction, or my talk is about the using accurate uh, panelised systems for the production of, and, uh, of, of buildings. So we have here, originally there was balloon framing, which Robert touched upon, but balloon framing really over in the United States when they had huge timbers, they cut out long, long uh, um, timber for the construction of the, of the panels. And the, the studs would have risen from the sole plate all the way through to the wall plate. And that's fine when you've got plenty of very tall uh, timbers, very tall trees. Also, the problem with that is really that you're, you're trying to build the whole wall from ground floor to first floor on a house in one go, which is interesting, but can be quite uh, dangerous on the health and safety front. So then we move on to platform framing, where we can use smaller timbers, we can build the walls, bring that up, put the floor on, and then build the first floor on top, and then build the roof. So you, it makes you, you're building a platform that you can work off 
to build the, the floors afterwards, which helps um, on the, the health and safety side of things. So moving on. So panels, um, there are a number of types of panel. There are the open panel, which is in the UK, if you look at most of what we call timber framing, it is an open panel. And um, you have your 140 stud, your OSB on one side, that is the panel built, it's taken out onto site. And then the insulation is added um, on site and the wires are run through on site. And then, and then it's closed off with a vapor um, control layer on the inside. And really that we find um, it is, you're leaving a lot of work to be carried out on site, which in the UK, coming from a craft background, coming from being on site, you're outside in the wet, in the cold, um, in the elements, it is not great. So really we need to work on a closed panel. The more work that you can do in the factory, the better. So this brings us on to the um, slide we have here. This is a closed panel. This is the panel that we predominantly use. So what we're building here is, uh, starting at the bottom, we have the panel vent sheathing, we have the, the timber eye joist, um, smart ply on the inside. And then on the outside, we have the, the counter battens the circuit to create the, the counter battens for the weatherboarding, render carrier, um, or you can set it up for brickwork or stonework. Um, on the inside, we have the, the, the smart ply. Then we have a, um, a counter button creating a service void. So the service void on the inside and the panels surround the oak framework. We are oak rights, it's what we're known for as building oak frame buildings. Um, so we build the encapsulation to surround the oak frame. So inside you have a very traditional building, outside you have the super insulated panel system, which can um, make a, a, a passive house or a passive building. Uh, next we have, so, one of the challenges that we have is we are taking a very traditional product or, or a construction form, which is the oak frame. You'll see here on the bottom right hand side of the slide, um, a structure that is uh, an oak frame. So you have the walls, you have the roof. It is not a, a rectangular building. So you have hips. Um, you're going to have uh, the straight wall panels. You'll have an angle cut where the corners join. When you move onto the roof, you'll actually have compound cuts uh, as well as angled cuts. So very quite complicated panels to be built to be attached to the oak frame. It would be a little bit like if you were attaching um, a panelized system to a steel frame building. You Quite often we, we are talking to builders that have, well, how accurate, accurate do we have to be? With what we build, you have to be very accurate because the oak frame has to be accurate, it's sort of virtually millimeter perfect, and the panel system that is connected around the oak frame has to be extremely accurate. Um, the oak frame gives the character, the beauty to the internal sort of, the, of the building. So you walk inside, you see these beautiful trusses, you see the structure, it is a tactile material. Uh, it feels like the building is living with you. Um, but we realized probably about 15 years ago that while oak framing with its traditional infill panel is fine, you need to be able to build an airtight building. And then we went on the mission to be able to build airtight panels that will surround the oak frame. So, Moving forwards, we eventually managed to build an oak frame or an oak frame that is a gained full passive house certification. And it, it was very challenging incorporating the oak frame, it was a full oak frame inside this house. This house overlooks the, the North Sea. It looks beautiful and sunny. I went there um, in, on a June day and it was absolutely freezing. The wind was howling in from the north, so I could see whether the lady and gentleman wanted to build a passive house. And we managed to carry the project through and gain full passive house certification. And we've gone on to build another um, fully certified oak frame passive house afterwards, and we're currently working on a project now that is passive house. So 
We then go on to the production. Um, and this is really what the talk, my talk is mainly about, is that the accuracy of building uh, a, a panel that is as accurate as can be. Where, if we take one step back, we talk about the open panel systems that are built in this country. And I think without being too rude, they sort of fit where they touch. And the reason for that is you put your slab down, you put your, your foundations in, and you, you bring up your, 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 your plinth wall, and then you, you put your timber frame on. And it is flexible. It can move slightly, it can adjust, and uh, you can take up the, the gap, so to speak. So in the production, most open frame panel systems in this country are built on framing tables by hand. And they are as accurate as the people who are making the frame. We have moved forward over the years to invest in CNC machinery, more and more CNC machinery. Above on the slide here, we'll see the, the latest addition is the, the, um, the speed cut. And that is on top of a 200 K2, a K2 and a K2I that we use for making the oak frame. And then we're using the speed cut now to cut very accurately all the studs, but also all the compound work. As you saw earlier, the shape of the oak frame that we're working with, most of our work, we, we build very few panels that are rectangular. Most of our panels have either got angle cuts or compound cuts. And we build those panels and we have managed to get to a point where we are successful at being able to build an oak frame and install very complicated panels uh, around the oak frame and make an airtight building and actually carry that forward to being a passive house. So the link that you need to have is not only the machinery, but you need to have the people who have the skill set to be able to use the CNC machinery, but not just to be able to use the CNC machinery, to have an understanding of the product that they are building. So what we try and do is we try and carry through um, the training of, of the teams from the, the frame designers, the architects. Architects need to understand. And when you're thinking about your project, this is I'm talking to the students now, you need to think about understanding the product you're going to work with. So our architects, we like them to understand oak framing and understand the, how the panel system will fit around the oak frame. Very important. You can make a... a a beautiful building that is very complicated and it will be very, very expensive to build. You can make a, a building that is, by its simplicity is very beautiful. And I would encourage you with your budget that you have on your design to keep your building as simple as possible. And um, that will help you build a more um, a, a, a building that is uh, to budget. So we have the, the uh, machinery that can carry us through to building either a simple building or a very complicated building. The difference will just be the cost. So here, we on the right hand side of this slide, we have here an overhead bridge. So this is a framing bridge. This is a CNC machine. So the designers feed in the panel systems to the, to, to the, the, the design goes down to the, uh, the framing shop. The uh, chap on the machine will be able to read the, the uh, information coming from the frame designer and then load in the machinery, which we saw previously it was all cut ready to go into the framing, into the overhead framing bridge. And that will frame, it squares the panels. It will uh, nail the panels at, at an exact spacing for the nails. It will route around the OSB. So it'll route the OSB slightly off the edge of the panel. So you don't, so it avoids creep when you're, joining the panels together. This is where you, where you get many panels joining, they will extend slightly, and when, which is possibly okay if you have no oak frame or steel frame inside. But if you have set dimensions between your oak frame or your steel frame, you need your windows to be in the, in the correct position. So you do not need creep. So the machine will route around the edge, take off the edge of the OSB. It will route out the windows. It is a steady production that just goes on and on. So while it doesn't look as though it's very fast, by the end of the day, you've built a vast amount of panel. On the left-hand side here, we see a wall panel, uh, sorry, a roof panel. So we can see the angled cuts here at the base. So this is where it's going to sit onto the wall plate. We've got set in there where we're going to have a skylight. 
And at the top, we've got the angle where the ridge is going to join to the ridge on the opposite side. Um, moving forwards, uh, there are a number of types of insulation you can use, and we use uh, cell cellulose insulation when we're building a passive house. So to build a closed panel, which is, we, which is all we do, we do not build open panels, you need to be able to build one side, so it comes through your nailing bridge, you have one side of your panel, you can put your OSB on, your breather membrane, your counter battens, your window openings cut and so forth. Then you need to be able to turn the panel over to work on the inside. And that is where the, um, where the uh, butterfly cables come in here, bottom left-hand side. So we are lifting up or turning over a panel. It, that will come up, it will flip over to the other table, drop down, and then we'll be able to work on the inside. Top right-hand corner is where our blowing machine, which we blow the cellulose in. So we're blowing cellulose in at 70 kilograms a cubic meter. That gives density. Uh, it is a recycled material and it creates a breathable wall. Um, on the bottom right, what we're showing there is in the housing market with planning, we have a lot, a vast amount of uh, store and a half buildings, which means we need to use dormer windows. So we, in the, in, the, in the workshops, will build the total dormer window, we'll install the windows, put on the ease and verge detail. But what we can see there is all the taping that is going on onto the membrane to make sure that the panel is airtight. So when the panel is joined to the uh, wall panels and uh, the other roof panels, we can take that, but we have a very airtight panel system. So, we uh, here we have the breathability and air tightness. So we are trying to build a, a beautiful oak frame inside, and then we are um, building our panels and our roof panels to create an airtight and super insulated envelope around the house or the or the commercial building. So we use cellulose. It, uh, uh, we pump it in at a density of seventy kilograms. That not only keeps the, the, the building warm in the winter, but also helps to keep it cool in the summer because it's extremely dense, where some of the products that are, will give the same U value are a lighter weight, and therefore uh, in the summertime, they will heat up more easily. And moving on. So here, what I've done, to achieve the same U value, I've, I've presented here different wall types that we can produce. So on the left hand side, 393 millimeters thick, we have, um, we've got here uh, rock wool inside. We've, uh, let's just talk this through. We've got a ventilated cavity, OSB board, CLS stud work, rock wool, uh, 75 mil PIR, and then a rock wool in the, in, the, in the service cavity, and then plasterboard on the inside. Um, all achieving a U value of 0 0.1. Now we can get slightly more uh, use some more natural materials here, more sustainable could be argued. So we've got the ventilated cavity, we've got Gutex Ultra Firm, which is wood fiber board. So we're using the wood fiber board, then we CLS stud work, um, rock wall insulation, uh, pro passive board, rock wall in the service void, and plaster board. Um, so we have the wood fiber board there giving us slightly more sustainable material. Moving on to the right hand side here, again at a U value of 0 0.1, but uh, uh, 477 millimeters as per the uh, middle panel that I presented. This is the panel that we call our natural wall, and this is what we are using when we are building um, when we are building a passive house or we would use on a passive building such as the students are designing. So we have uh, a ventilated cavity. Yeah, on the outside, you can have weatherboarding, you could have a render board, you could set it up for brickwork or stonework. We have 60 millimeter wood fiber board. This is Gutex showing here. We have an eye joist, 300 millimeter eye joist. Then we have a cellulose insulation uh, between the eye joist, the 12 millimeter pro passive board. And then we have a service cavity and plasterboard. Um, so this is the this is the panel system that we would uh, tend to use on um, uh, if we're building a passive house. Now, there are things to consider. The panel on the left-hand side will be the uh, monetary, the cheapest to build in actual cost up front. The panel on the right-hand side will possibly be the 
most expensive to build up front. But then when you are coming into full life uh, cost of running the building, because of its ability and the density uh, to keep uh, the building cooler in the summer, it means that you will not be needing to use any air conditioning. So there'll be a saving. So the whole life cost of the building will potentially be less on the right, with the right-hand side panel than it will on the left-hand side panel. And also because it is a breathable system, it gives a more pleasant environment to live in with it within the building. Um, it is a little bit like a, a, the left-hand side would give you the, 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 the um, U-value. It would also be a little bit like on a rainy day wearing a plastic Mac, straight plastic Mac. The panel, you'll be dry, but you probably won't have a very pleasant environment inside. On the right-hand side, we have a breathable panel system, and that will give you a more comfortable environment inside, a little bit, little bit like wearing a Gore-Tex jacket. So you'll be able to breathe more comfortably, but you'll be kept dry. And moving on. Now then, this is really, this is quite hot off the press. You should be very interested in this when we go back to Grenfell. These are tests that have just been carried out on a cellulose insulated I-beam uh, system like our breathable wall system. This was carried out by Penny Coyd at a, um, a laboratory in Northern Ireland. So what we have here is a fire test. The standard fire test requires for domestic to, to meet 30 minutes. And here we have a basic um, cellulose insulated wall, which achieved uh, 86 minutes, 89 minutes, I do apologize, 89 minutes before it, it broke down. So this far exceed the standard um, for domestic use uh, fire resistance. So what we have here is a, a panel built of a recycled material. It is breathable. Uh, so it is very sustainable, but also we are achieving 89 minutes actual on the, on, on the panel so, uh, for fire resistance. So overcoming a lot of the challenges that timber has. So we have a, a, a wonderful material, it's fully sustainable. We can grow the material, uh, we can use recycled material that has come from, the, from timber and we're building a panel system that will meet 89 minutes uh, fire resistance. So absolutely fantastic. Um, going back to what Robert mentioned earlier about um, getting onto site, you need to look at the site you are designing for. We can build panels up to eight meters long, three meters high, and um, we try to build as few panels as possible because the more joins that you have on your building, um, the more opportunity there is for challenges with air tightness. So we try and build the panel completely in the workshop use all the taping, do as few, a few panel joints on site. So think about your site. But I will say, while we can build these larger panels, on the projects that we work on throughout the UK, there is normally an access problem or an access challenge in some way. So you need to really study the size of the lorries that you'll be able to get onto the site. Normally a crane is not so much of a problem because a crane with its uh, all, all wheel steer will get onto the site where sometimes the lorries can't. So that, that you need to think about. Here on the left hand side, you'll see panels. These are roofing panels stacked up, ready to go. So this is about not only the access onto site, but the logistics of getting as many panels as possible onto the lorries. So the size of the lorry will dictate the size of panel and the, and the access will dictate the size of the lorry onto site. So they all need to work together to get the correct size panel onto the lorry, maximum size onto site, to get as few joins as possible with the panels that you are building on, on your project. And the less panels there are, the less crane lifts there are, the less cost there is, the speedier the project will go. But that is only if you can get those panels onto site. So we are moving on. Um, with a post and beam frame, you can make you can make features of the structure. You can actually you don't need to cover all of the structure in inside in some way. So you can perhaps face mount all of your services that maybe give the more industrial look of the type of building that you are designing. That in ways can look more um, interesting. And for a commercial building, be, it can give that sort of a, a working feel to the building, which would work which would work well. Um, 
There's lots of software out there to help you. This is, um, so we've got here the Climber Plus. Lieb uh, uh, as a crane company actually do uh, a crane um, planner. So you can plan out the crane for the reach, the, 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 the length of reach that you need for your crane jib to lift the panels and, and work that through. So I think I'm about there with my talk. And as I say, Robert did a fantastic job first of all. So um, took a, 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 up a lot of the points there. I let me just move on. So the reference is here. I hope you found it interesting. And what I would say to any of the students, if you're in heaven, and you're thinking of designing the building, you are more than welcome to come along and visit us. And the one thing to consider with the product that you are choosing to use within your construction would be how close is it being produced to the site where you are? Now we transport all over the country, but obviously the further away we get, the more costly it becomes. Um, so think about the, the, the distance and also where the materials are produced. And we can talk through where our materials are produced. The cellulose at the present moment is actually produced in Switzerland. There are other companies who bring cellulose in from the Czech Republic. But there, are, there is talk at the moment of reopening a factory in the UK to make the cellulose here, which would be absolutely fantastic. Now, I know that... Um, Rockwell is actually built down at Bridge End, so that is close, closer to what well, is built within the UK, but also it's reasonably close to the, the project that might be happening in Hereford. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting, of interest. Um, if you would like to visit us, please touch base and we'd love to show you around the factory and the design studios. Thank you very much indeed. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tim. What an amazing and so, so so generous as well not just with um you, you know your knowledge and, and and all the work you've already done at oak rights to be able to share that with uh, the students tonight uh, but literally to give them a little bit of a head start in terms of thinking about you know the site and its requirements and what to do um, and i have to say as someone who is sitting here battening down the hatches overlooking uh, the north sea i am insanely jealous of that beautiful passive house oak built <laughs> Um, Tim, if you're able to stop sharing, and then um, Helena, can I invite you to, to come join us and share your presentation? There we go. All good on your side? Looks great. Brilliant. Thank you. So very much thank you. Uh, extend my thanks to the previous two speakers because now I don't have to do anything with the introductory part of telling what I am doing in terms of technology. I will instead look at the aspect what happens if you go scale, uh, so large scale, with any of the methods that was previously presented. Uh, and uh, I will look into the principles of manufacturing uh, what it can do for a company that's looking at producing at scale and why those things are important. So this will be a scientific approach to, you know, output as much as possible with, with as little uh, that you have available. Uh, I'm representing volumetric building companies. I'm their CTO, means that I'm in charge of the building systems that are within the scope and uh, it uh, is actually now containing both uh, timber uh, modular frame and then also steel frame modular. Uh, so this will be an exciting new opportunity also for me. Uh, I uh, have been here for six weeks now. So let's see if I can get this rolling. So as, as further uh, introduced, I will not go through this. I'm not as shy to tell about the number of years though. So I have 20 plus years in this industry. Uh, I enjoy it heavily and uh, I'm used to doing this at scale at Limbex where I was part of the new uh, factory expansion uh, with an output of uh, 16 modules per shift uh, um, with the factory design. And it means I know a little bit about how to serve uh, the internal supply chain and how to do uh, that uh, at scale. 
So right now, um, I want to move into the concepts uh, that we uh, that I'm going to speak about and why they are there and how they can serve anyone who wants to uh, venture into this business and uh, doing it uh, large scale. So manufacturing is an overarching um, thinking uh, of me and myself and others that are in this industry. Uh, there are three concepts that I want to, to speak about. Uh, first, there is the platform concept, which is the container, more or less, uh, the method to capture and organize uh, what we are manufacturing, the parts. Uh, and uh, those parts are the one I want to repeat between the projects. Uh, so they, they really are very uh, good assets for a company. Uh, because if you have that knowledge recorded and uh, you are less prone to lose that if you lose a single person. And uh, the same thing goes for the processes that you're using. So the knowledge that Tim was bringing up uh, about how to, for example, run a Hunberger machine or a Randic machine uh, would be something that's very near and dear to a company that will try to utilize um, repetition. And then there is a process uh, method uh, to get everything um, aligned to really produce it uh, at scale. And that's the design for manufacturing and assembly. Uh, the DFMA method uh, is something that will give you, uh, in addition to regular design that looks at structural design and also what are the properties of the system, what does your envelope has to cope with in terms of structural requirement, it adds that element of manufacturability into the equation. And it's absolutely necessary uh, as a method to be able to, to produce it um, at scale. And it's, it's a very you know, nitty gritty part of, of uh, designing. So here it comes down to speaking about, um, oh, can my tool fit uh, within this cavity to uh, be able to fasten it properly? Uh, and am I able to do that uh, 40 times every day uh, to keep uh, control of cost, but also manage uh, people? The FMA is part of the lean manufacturing paradigm, uh, and those are principles and methods known to almost everyone in manufacturing. It's a suite of methods to perfect your uh, internal supply chain, uh, and it only really works if you have uh, repetition and standardization in place. So if you're attempting something else, uh, I would rather say that look somewhere else also. It's not like a quick fix that can do anything. It really has uh, its limitations. So let's talk about platform. This is actually my role. I'm, I'm uh, in charge of keeping the platform uh, together here at BBC. Uh, so it, it's first, oh, and foremost, the technology, all the parts that you need uh, to repeat between the projects. And those were very graphically shown by both Tim and, uh, and Robert. Uh, so, you know, the, these would be your building elements. So this is the, the floor, this is the uh, roof, this is the wall that you're using. Uh, and of course, they exist both uh, in real life, but also they exist as uh, digital models. Uh, and those processes that are needed to produce them is in another box, but very closely tied uh, to the technology. And then there is a part that, that's very uh, important. Those would be the suppliers that are tied into the operations via these long-term contracts, but also the supplier's own internal processes that can affect the overall operations. And this is just a, an area where construction as a whole is really exploring what that can give. Other industries has come much further when you look at supply chain relations. So if you, for example, enter the world of um, producing automotive in, in any sense, you could have a supplier that comes in with a whole uh, module that's going to fit into your product. Uh, and that uh, has to be perfect in terms of the interface uh, management. And you could imagine the supply chain for um, construction being maybe here comes a supplier that can give you a bathroom pod uh, and the bathroom pod will have to fit with all its fixtures uh, for water, for electrical, for ventilation. 
that would have to line up perfectly uh, with your uh, structure to be able to receive that product. And all this is knowledge that is really constituting the core of the company. So um, ripping this out from the company by exchanging people uh, is something that uh, needs to be mitigated by creating this platform. So design for manufacturing and assembly is something that is um, needs to be taught more heavily, I think, at universities. I would be happy to, to uh, do that if needed. Uh, and uh, it needs to look at, okay, so here's a solution. Here's a technical solution, that's good. But is it something that can be produced and sustained over time? That's a little bit of a different question. So I, I meet uh, many innovators that say, I have the best solution. This is gonna re revolutionize uh, construction. And uh, you, you just have to ask a few basic questions to them to understand if this is really something that uh, will do that. And for example, uh, you can ask, oh, do you have a sustainable uh, supply for your raw materials? Uh, because if you don't, you will have a very volatile process uh, downstream. Uh, you can ask, are you able to keep tolerances within your uh, production of this product? And if they don't even know what a tolerance is, uh, you just steer clear because this is going to be very important. Now, that's design for manufacturing. Design for assembly is how quickly can you assemble this? And to Tim's earlier point, um, keeping the number of parts down and choose very simple solutions. Uh, you also have to be knowledge about, knowledgeable about uh, what kind of tools are you actually using and the accessibility of those uh, with the crew you're, you're having. So you, you cannot design something that needs uh, a special uh, tool unless you make sure that that special tool is also available and uh, the people know how to use it. So uh, make sure that you're, you're staying within uh, whatever is the framework uh, unless you really need that, and then you have to change the framework to make that um, do it, doable. Uh, the last point here, work with gravity, is something that uh, I see often that that doesn't really happen. So for example, uh, I do multi-story all the time. I spoke with one guy, guy yesterday, and he, he said that, yeah, we had flanges on our windows. That's the, the normal US way of doing it is to have a flange around the windows that's integrated in the window frame. And when he was working uh, three stories up on a multi-story, he uh, described to me that uh, it's not uncommon to really take that window, tip it over on the diagonal, two guys holding it, pushing it through the um, hole that was pre-made, turning it back and fitting it right back in. Uh, and, and that's working against gravity, which is not a good principle. Can we do something else? That's what I want to get at. I think most of you know something about lean manufacturing. I'm not going to go into this. Um, it's very much about just study what you have, make it better. Study what you have, make it better. And two, that means um, all those methods that are listed here has been developed. Uh, and just do remember that these are methods. Doesn't matter if you apply them unless you actually have that mindset. Uh, so you look at the problem and you make it better by applying uh, the method in a very sustainable and analytical way to move forward. Uh, I'm a big fan of all these methods. I'm not a big fan of, of uh, putting the method first and then not explaining what it does. So I would say to anyone who wants to venture into lean manufacturing, yes, you should do that, uh, but don't get confused about all the words uh, and all the, all the stuff that's uh, flying around out there, uh, just being pieces um, that, you, uh, that could not lead you wrong. Uh, instead, do some, do some basic studying. Um, for example, read uh, The Goal uh, but by Elia Goldratt. Uh, and you will get the concept uh, without uh, any of these uh, words that are up on the screen right now. Yes, so how, uh, what do you need to get this to work now? What is the road to Nirvana? Uh, you need repetitive parts. Um, 
whatever you produce must have some degree of repetition. Otherwise, uh, platform strategies and lead manufacturing will fail. It's just a basic fact. So if you're doing something else, don't look to this. Planning horizon uh, is very much needed. So you need piecewise stability in your process. Uh, it means that you need to make decisions early uh, and stick with them through uh, the process. So in, in actual terms, when you, when you are standing on your manufacturing floor and the architect enters and says, oh, I want to change these windows, uh, that's the moment that you do not want. Uh, you have to take care of that situation much earlier. So there is no change when anything enters uh, your production floor. 80% of your cost is production, 80%. But 80% of your decisions happens before production. So the shadow that design casts over these processes of manufacturing is, is huge. So um, the freeze point where you freeze design is a very important uh, concept that you need to apply to get give some peace and quiet into manufacturing. Uh, and it can be a few weeks. It can be what I have here between 8 to 16 weeks. It depends on your lead time for uh, buying your materials, really. Uh, I always try to repeat uh, and uh, standardize the work processes that are under the hood, uh, not so important to the client because they have less um, opinions about that. So I would be happy to say to you that you can choose any color you want. Uh, you can do any cabinetry you like. You can do whatever you like, wish for appliances, that's fine. If you start talking to me about how the floor touches to the wall, and in what manner, I would say, that's not for you, that's for me. So let's go further and see what we can, uh, we can look into here. These would be basic process steps in industrialized construction. And uh, when you're looking at construction as a whole, uh, I think you would agree that there is a sales process, there is a design, there is purchasing, manufacturing, maybe not, and construction. So you have all the bits and pieces that you have in normal construction uh, up here on the, on the screen. But you also have a few others. Um, Pre-con or pre-construction is the planning of the site. And when you're working industrialized, this needs to happen uh, in parallel with other processes because otherwise your construction um, process will be very difficult. And this is, uh, was shown very well by Tim just a few minutes ago, uh, where he showed how you have the lifting straps and how you have the set sequence and how you are going to deliver uh, your materials and building parts to the site. Then for manufacturing, which is the factory process, uh, you need a pre-manufacturing team. So anything that goes online, uh, also to Tim's earlier point, you need someone to create the machine files. You need someone to create the information that these uh, machines will run on. Someone ha will have to make the lists for logistics to work on uh, to deliver um, your materials to the line. And that is the pre-manufacturing phase. So you see, you add a few steps into your uh, construction process. And those the, this addition will make your timeline um, longer before you go online, but it will shorten your timeline after you uh, have your production. So on average, uh, I've been looking at this now from both Swedish and US conditions. And if you do this for a modular design uh, building, you probably cut off a year from your client uh, timeline instead of going towards a site built uh, construction. It wouldn't cut cost that much. You have the same cost approximately, but it would cut off a year on the other side. So the return on investment is much faster. And you think that's the strongest argument um, for industrialized construction. Let's look at what I'm doing. I'm here. Uh, I'm sitting in the office, which is, I will show you, it's over here. Uh, and uh, this is the factory that I have just uh, behind me here. 
and uh, it's 577 square feet uh, and I think that's around 56,000 uh, square meters. It's uh, the old Kutera facility uh, that VBC bought and what you're looking at is a sketch of the um, uh, transformation. So we will move this from being a um, panel production plant into being a modular plant. And uh, over to your left is the cabinet line that we're keeping and everything from this line forward will be uh, for modular production. So we will be making floors uh, on a floor line. It will be in the end be automated, in the beginning be uh, um, manual. I'm happy for that because we have to learn. So we have a ramp up plan running over one and a half years uh, to get this um, uh, facility up to speed. Uh, the floors will be timber frame. It will not be exactly as on the picture here. Uh, so we will have timber frame with LVL rims. Uh, we will uh, produce at the end uh, 10 of these every day uh, or in the beginning just two. We have uh, wall lines, two of them. Uh, one we are running uh, tests on right now, so make sure that we, are, uh, we can produce two tolerance. Um, I'm used to, as, as Tim just earlier showed, I'm used to having closed panels working on both sides, having very thick walls. I'm, I come from Sweden, we are a very cold country, so this is, uh, this is right up my alley. Um, the product that we are going to produce here in Tracy is going to be simpler. Uh, so I'm happy for that. It's easier to automate. Two wall lines, they will output um, one wall every 15 minutes uh, in the end. Uh, in the beginning, we are crawling, to, uh, just like we're doing right now. There will be a ceiling line, which is very similar, actually, to producing a floor. So in the beginning, we will be making floors and ceilings from the same line. But once we speed up, we need a separate ceiling line, and it will be uh, making ceilings at the same rate at as floors. And then timber modules. Uh, I also snitched a, a picture from my uh, former company. Uh, so this is a module from Limbex and uh, we are going to make them a little bit different, uh, but um, we will have 37 seats uh, across here uh, for all the modules and uh, whatever is happening down here uh, will be materials that will feed the line. So we will have material feeds coming in here uh, so we can complete um, the modular line. Any one of you on this uh, conversation who's ever been to an automotive factory will understand exactly what's going on here. This is fishbone production. So the actual value flow starts down here, transfers over, transfers over there, and it goes out the door uh, on your far right. And anything that uh, needs to be fed here is going to do so as the product passes by. So let's look into the application of DFMA here. And for this, I have uh, not reached conclusion yet, uh, but I'll, I'll let you in on what I'm working with. So let's look at this. Uh, this these are the uh, details that are, are used today. Uh, and it's used in a manual facility. So this would be a top view, and this would be a side view of a particular part of the, the floor element. This is how you hang your joists to the floor rim. And the uh, joist is here, floor rim is here, uh, double LVLs over here. And I need to have a kind of board uh, in between here because um, the code here requires us to cover it up for uh, the potential fire that could come, uh, could address it. So if you look at this now from a DFMA perspective, what will happen? Yeah, to the left, uh, you have a detail where you can shoot your nail straight through. Um, it means that you can access from the side of the element, uh, which would be quite easy uh, for someone. And then you can add the second rim uh, on the outside here. So yeah, doable. The other uh, proposition, the same engineering firm that did this, uh, is to use hangers and then nail from the inside of the element. Now that means you have to have someone that climbs on top of the element uh, for every uh, 
hanger that's there. You have to do the shooting of the nails from the inside and also on an inclination and then shoot nails through to uh, secure the fast uh, and secure the hanger, sorry. Uh, and it means that this work would probably take, I would say three times what it does on the left side. So this is a clear example where you, with a DFMA principle, can uh, work through detailing and increase speed for the entire line. We should look at another example, which is uh, top view. This is the exterior wall. This is an interior wall. Uh, so look at the placement of the fastener here. The fastener runs from this stud and into uh, the exterior wall stud. So what needs to happen for that to work? Yeah, you have to leave out this part or um, of the sheeting. So your hand and tool can go in here and do the screw straight through. Otherwise you cannot reach. So why won't we go from the outside instead, have a longer screw and attach it that way. And then we can close up the element already on the line and be done with it. So that's also a second example of how you need to think to be able to be fast, but also fulfill code. And the last one is this one, which is the corner of a module wall wall and same thing happens there needs something needs to happen here and one of these boards would have to, to be left open unless you just decide to go from the other side and screw uh, through the entire uh, stud back right so uh, one of the things i discovered here when i one of the first weeks is that i'm used to doing this uh, working with gravity Windows are one of the heaviest components that you will have in your structure. And uh, you can install them lying flat unless you have a flange on them. So I'm coming back to the flange situation again. And the, the one on the right is what I saw happening uh, in one of the factories over here in the US. So you have two guys, it's a heavy window. You have this flange that I'm talking about. It prevents the window from being uh, you cannot push it in from the inside. You have to go from the outside. And uh, you see what happens. It's difficult. It's um, the, you could potentially just break it uh, during this operation. Uh, I really like the other way of doing it where you can keep everything protected. So let's see if I can change things up here while I move along. Uh, so the parallel workflows is something I'm really looking very closely to having. Um, I want to uh, decrease manufacturing time by doing parallel work. Um, this example of a bathroom pod is something that would fit well into that. So instead of having all that work, all that cure time in the main line, I would make the uh, bathroom pod on the side and lift it into the final module. Uh, so I can have all that cure and set time on the side here, and then this line can run faster. And this can only be possible if you're working with modularization as a concept, uh, which means breaking down what you have in parts, documenting that and reusing it over several uh, projects. And the, uh, the pros of this is that it sets you up for design automation. So you actually can sustain um, the investment in machinery. Uh, it sets you up for having prefab and sub assemblies actually possibly even made by someone else in the end. You don't have to manufacture everything yourself. You can do it uh, through suppliers. But the important thing that you wanna get at is of course cost reduction over time through repetition. If it's with you or if it's with the supplier, that's to be decided. And then uh, the cons here is that if you don't get that right, if you're doing the, the wrong module, so to say, if you're choosing a solution that the market will not accept, um, that's going to set you up for failure. And I've seen that happen too, where you're just not in tune with what the market really wants and you're doing it uh, on the wrong product. Because this is expensive, of course. This is not something you just do. You have to know that this is something that you will sustain over several years. Uh, also, the sales process needs to be super structured. And, and sad, sad to say, this is not the case in construction. Uh, many people in construction are just very, very good at saying yes. 
and super nervous about saying no because they think their customer will simply go to someone else. It could happen, but then that process was not for you then. Right, so when I work with layout here together with my team, uh, I'm working very hard with some of the lean principles, uh, one of them being 5S. So this material warehouse that you're looking at here, you see it's almost half of the space that's reserved for modular. Um, every material has their exact place. Uh, there is space for transportation, it would be those white lines here, where I know my forklift can enter. Uh, I have a labeling for every material bin here, so I know where they sit. And I also will couple an ERP system to this so I can keep track of inventory. Uh, I need to have tools organized next to workstations. So here I will have a material facade uh, with also the tooling needed for every station. So everything is set up to not running around finding tools, not running around finding your materials. It needs to be there when you need it. And when you need it, it's controlled by just in time. So materials will be brought to the line on demand. Uh, not a lot of material hanging around close to the lines here because it will only um, be in the way for you when you work. Uh, so it will be brought on demand with the truck driver coming over here, uh, forklift driver coming over here, sorry. Uh, and I want to have this uh, with a quite short turnover, which could be difficult with the volatility that we have in the supply chain right now. Um, the space that he, that's here, at full production, it will hold two weeks. Um, in the beginning, it will hold much more than that. And then there's, of, of course, a science to understand how you can distribute your work tasks along the line. So you distribute them uh, on over several stations, and it means that you now can start measuring. Um, so the sum of work at one station is calibrated to match uh, that on the whole line uh, of the stations. And this is called line balancing. This is a method to, to really organize your manufacturing so you won't have one station that has all the work and then uh, end up with that being the bottleneck of your operations. There are experts about this that you can get for this. You don't have to know all this yourself. This is something you can get from manufacturing industry and they will understand what's happening. So don't, don't worry, you don't need to do it all yourself. Single piece flow, we're setting this up to run on a 60 minute tact uh, in the end, uh, possibly faster when we uh, are it trimmed, but uh, in the beginning, no. So it will move uh, at a 60 minute pace. So it means that one module here moves to the next station every 60 minutes. Uh, means that one floor moves from here to here every 60 minutes. So every table I have here will have 60 minutes worth of uh, work tasks. Needs to go faster here in the wall line because uh, there are more walls than there are ceilings and uh, floors. Uh, so they will have to be faster. So the wall line is quite naturally, the first part that you would um, automate in this factory. Yes, and do remember, uh, no such thing as running uh, everything at full capacity at all times. Uh, so the people will be missing because they are on sick leave or whatnot. Uh, something will be broken at all times. Materials will be missing somewhere along this. I have a list of a bomb that's over 200 positions. So uh, that everything should be in the same place uh, correctly all the time is impossible. So there's a measure for this, which is overall equipment efficiency. And it's often somewhere between 70 and 85%. So if you are at 85 or even 90%, you're, you're running a facility that's really, really good. Right, so. Some definitions, this will be flying, uh, flying around uh, for people um, in this uh, manufacturing um, industry. They will say these, these things to you. And since this is recorded, I think it would be a good idea for me to deliver what it is. Uh, so the lead time is the time between order received and order delivered. So the lead time in this process is not 60 minutes 
the lead time is when is the time that this one first hits the floor here, enters as the first product until it goes out the door. And that would probably be something like 10 days or two weeks. So the cycle time now is a result of the process. This is how fast I do move from one position to another. And the cycle time here, I will try to have at 60 minutes, that's my goal, uh, but this, the result can be different. So cycle time is something that happens when I move from one position to another. And the tech time is the requirement on cycle time. The tech time has nothing to do with the manufacturing. Tag time is something I need to understand from the demand. So when I set the goal for cycle time, I look at the tag time. Oh, it needs to be 60. Tag needs to be 60. That's good uh, because that's what I need as an output. But then when I go into manufacturing, I talk about cycle times. I can have a cycle time of 75 minutes, but I need to have a tag time of 60. So the last uh, few slides here will be about how do you perfect this and uh, one of the best ones is the plan do check act cycle this is old 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 uh, known technology since more than 30 years um, and you will probably fail the first time you do it uh, don't feel discouraged uh, you will uh, do, make it in the end there are good uh, tools to help you understand this, this I downloaded the other day, uh, it's the A3 method, how you just follow one, two, three, four, blah, 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 all the way through and uh, you are done. Uh, good coaching is also available from anyone that would be a lean coach. And uh, the one thing that I do think you will do the first time is that you will end up getting stuck here. So you do all these fancy plans and you uh, maybe you make a prototype, but then you forget about the other part, which is when you run into manufacturing and you will have to do all those checks that it actually was what you intended. And then the implementation phase here to teach everyone now to, to handle your product. Uh, that's where it fails most of the time. So in summary, industrialized construction, that I've been working with all my life and will be working with all my life, benefits from manufacturing principles. Site operations are more difficult to streamline, streamline using the same principles. And I would refer you to Lean Construction and the world of experts inside that for support methods. The three concepts we have been speaking about, the platform assets, they are containers for the knowledge in the company. Uh, only do this if you need to, you know, you're entering into a corporation where they want to live over a long time and they want to profit from the knowledge that are internal, then a platform is perfect. Uh, otherwise, it's actually adding cost. If you're not doing that, stay out of it. Design for manufacturing and assembly, that's a design method that will streamline and speed up uh, your downstream processes. Same here, if you're not working with repetition, if you're not working with Lean, stay out of the FMA. If you're a regular uh, consultant in construction, uh, not doing manufacturing, not doing um, anything but site work that you don't think you are going to repeat, don't do it. Lean manufacturing is a production strategy and it is a production strategy. So it means it, it's linked to production manufacturing. It's useful for streamlining and improving manufacturing processes. It's not useful for streamlining and improving on other types of processes. So do understand that there are moments in life when Lean is not functional, uh, even though you will meet people that, that tell you uh, just straight up that you can use it for everything. So with all that said, and this a little bit abstract, uh, I hope that you still found it interesting and uh, I welcome any questions. I'm very also interested in having people uh, working with me. So if you have anything to, you know, re just reach out, you will find me on LinkedIn. Thank you so much. 
Brilliant. Thank you so much, Helena. And uh, I just want to say a huge thank you to Helena, Robert and Tim for joining us this evening and sharing such wonderful, brilliant presentations. Um, if if um, if there are students who are taking part in this competition who weren't here tonight, they've truly missed out. And I, I know we could say that about all of the webinars, but really there were some absolute gems of knowledge in there for them all. So thank you again all so much. Um, I have to say our chat function has been, um, I'm hoping it's not just me, it's been very quiet. You must have been too comprehensive in terms of your speaking that nobody, nobody is under any, you know, they've got no gaps in their knowledge. They're, they've completely covered it all. Um, so at that point, I'm going to say, come on, guys, turn on your uh, videos, ask some questions. Let's not let these guys go away into their evening without being quizzed a little bit. Tabitha's probably got a question. That's Tabitha in the chat, isn't it? Yeah. Hugh, do you have a question? I do, yeah. Um, to, to Helena. Um, really interesting. I re the vertical integration thing is something that has been not bugging me, but something has been I've been really intrigued by for a while. Um, I was con I was um, going to ask about. You've talked about the vertical integration pre-construction and into construction and kind of final site fit. Um, I was wondering what your opinions on kind of modular construction are for design for disassembly. So end of life use, as Robert mentioned, and sequestration and reuse of recycled materials. Um, aluminium facade recycling is something that just cropped into my head, but um, like the longer term relationship between concurrent construction companies and kind of their relationship with the building after it's gone up and how modular building and um, design for manufacture can relate to that really. Thank you. Oh, it's a very good question uh, and it's also straight on point because uh, all the principles that I, I adhere to here is uh, is really very good for what you're alluding to uh, the destructibility the, the disassembly and possible reuse of what we're having and producing is going to be I think very important in the future and if you're you're using the FMA it uh, there is nothing to say that you cannot you know reverse that process um, and probably it would be good to have some principles in there to also think about the uh, disassembly. So let's go back to my example where I have the uh, joining of a box and you're actually coming from the outside. It means that when you're disassembling, you can use the same technology. And I think the one thing that will be difficult in the future is that the, the long lifespan of a building also then requires you to, to document exactly what you did. Otherwise, the person who comes in 50 years, huh, how am I going to do this? And, you know, builders, they bring out the heavy tools and then you're, you're lost. So there needs to, to be some precision in that. Yeah, um, it's again, it's that, it's that relationship between, again, you mentioned like under the hood stuff for clients as well. How do you tell your client, we are sort of planning for the fact that we're going to have to take this building down, but mm -hmm. also the fact that we want it to be recyclable. It's like a, it's an interesting balance you have to make between selling them the perfect infinite time mm -hmm. house versus kind of the structure of this will need to be reused. Yeah, that, that is a very difficult question because the technology to do what we're talking about here is, is here. I mean, it's not difficult to plan for that. But what it does, it's incur costs into your design phase. So it's a difficult sell because your client is not the one who's going to reap the benefits. But we are talking about a building and it could be, I'm, I'm going to be very blunt here, but your representative from the client might not be alive. So, I mean, it's, it is a very difficult question. So the incentives for doing this, uh, I think will have to change and probably uh, it needs to be done from a higher level to uh, incentivize everyone to do it uh, much like we've done with carbon and uh, this you know you're you're measuring the carbon dioxide and whatever is there uh, people adhere to that and the industry adhere to that in a in a period of 10 years and this could happen also to to this space yeah i'm trying to be optimistic about it for sure yeah yeah you should you should <laughs> yeah it's a brilliant take though you know like previously it's like in the long run we're all dead so it doesn't really matter what we do now but now it's like in the long run we're all dead so we actually need to be able to take this down and let other people build it i love that fantastic yeah, that's, <laughs> that's very true actually because yeah. we have to take care of this and i think the there is awareness that this needs to happen 
it's just as always construction is on the, the last um, player to understand that we need to add so yeah i'm hopeful brilliant thanks so much for those questions here they were they were excellent questions tavisa you have your your hand up yeah, one final question. I know we're, we're running quite late. Um, so obviously our clients want to build or have designed and build a building that it sits very lightly on the planet. Um, obviously they're not fussed if it's modern methods of construction or not, or, you know, um, one, where should our designers and our engineers, like if, if there's one place to start, knowing it's gonna be 800 square meters and they've got about 2000 pounds a square meter to build with. Just one final tip from our fantastic panel. I mean, if Tim doesn't say oak here, yeah, I'm going to be like, I can what? speak. I can speak here. <laughs> I, can, I can manage to unmute myself, which is quite amazing. Um, simplicity. Simplicity of design, streamlining of design. Think about the orientation of the building if you're going to work with a passive house design and keep, the, keep the, the, the shape simple. If you if you can try and link in with the, the company who you're going to work with to build the building, you need to work around the, the size of the materials, the standard size of materials. So you're simplifying the design, you're working within the size of the material that you're working with, and that can be the, the length, the timber, the size of the board, and that will help you to keep the cost down to meet your budget. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, uh, I think that's that's completely on point, and it because um, it sounds simple to keep it simple, right? But we're human beings, so we just sort of, and I'm one, like I'm probably the, you know the culprit for a bit, you know, the, the complexity just takes over, you know. But it's just starting off like almost, um, you know, what is the resource you're going to use? What palette of parts are you thinking about? Um, and then just simple things like a grid or standard sizes, you know, a standard window size as opposed to, you know, an un, a non-standard one or, you know, so it, it's it's trying to, because you can take that, that simplicity and do something very com compelling with it. And I think within that is what we often do is, or what often seems to happen certainly is a building is designed and then the materials are often like thought about afterwards. So it's like the building is designed relative to, you know, almost the, the functionality without thinking about how that's, how the materials can respond to that. And you, so you have to think about both up front and then use that palette of parts to respond to the, to the required functionality. Um, otherwise that, so that, because that's what ultimately results in the, the, the complexity so uh, yeah i would i would i would go along with that it's it's it really is about yeah and hopefully i, I think hopefully that um the, the, the presentations which i thought were, were you know were fantastic um they sort of displayed that in terms of just thinking about thinking about what you're doing in a, in a logical manner so that you can reach that that end end result and you know in terms of also just picking up and, and it was in both both presentations in terms of that you know the sort of whole life value of it in, in terms of thinking of what is that what is the whole life cost um, and that comes back to that whole you know ultimately that disassembly piece and reutilization so it's not just thinking about upfront cost and it's thinking about that whole life value so yeah yes i can just add to uh that a little bit uh from the creativity perspective that's one of the, the things when i work with students is that uh, there is uh, there's an obvious creativity that has to do with how you invent new things so you you kind of want to go there because you understand that creativity but there is a a much more fun creativity is to find you know the solution within the combination of the solutions that are already there it's another way of of taking on creativity. So I always encourage uh, students and people around to think of it as, as Tetris. This is, you have your pieces, they are there. You don't have to invent new pieces to get them to fit. Your job is to fit them together. So yes, that would be my take on it. 
That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much to all, all three of our speakers, Robert, Helena and Tim tonight. Absolutely brilliant presentations. And, and like I said, anyone who's not here has really missed out. And <laughs> um, that's it, as um, Tabitha has shared in the chat. Um, PowerPoints and we obviously record these sessions and pop them on YouTube so everyone can see them. Um, what we're going to do now is um, say again a big thank you to our speakers and let them depart into their evening. We really do appreciate you giving up your, your time to be with us. Um, but I think, um, uh, Tabitha, you're going to stay on for another 10-15 minutes or so. If anyone does have any questions about the logistics or about the, the event itself, then it, not the event, sorry, the competition itself, uh, that now is your time to, to chime in. Um, I, I'm going to have to run away as well, I'm afraid, but uh, I look forward to all seeing you again at a webinar very soon. I just uh, want to say thank you to everyone again. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, Tim. Fantastic. Thanks, Kirsty, for 